Eddie S. Glaude Jr. is an author who speaks to the black and blue in America. His most well-known books, Democracy in Black, How Race Still Enslaves the American Soul, and In a Shade of Blue, Pragmatism and the Politics of Black America, take a wide look at black communities and reveal complexities, vulnerabilities, and opportunities for hope. Hope, that is, in one of his favorite quotes from W.B. Du Bois, not hopeless, but a bit unhopeful. Other muses include James Baldwin, Malcolm X, and Bobby Blue Island. In addition to his readings of uh, early American philosophers and contemporary political scientists, Glaude turns to African American literature in his writing and teaching for insight into African American political life, religious thought, gender, and class. Langston Glaude is a junior at Brown University majoring in Africana studies. His studies primarily focus on the prison industrial complex, particularly prison and police reform in the US, and institutional racism within criminal justice system, education, and politics. Langston has worked with many social justice organizations, such as the Dream Defenders, and interned with the Fair Sentencing Project at Harvard Law School. He plans to continue his social justice work well beyond Brown. the audience, so I have microphones here, I'll walk the aisle and pass the mic to you with you, but I just want to be welcome, a lot family. How y'all doing? Can you hear me? Yes. How about me? Yes. Good. Ooh, good. It's been a minute since I've been in this area. Like, <laughs> I remember when I used to sit in seats just like this, man, this is crazy. <laughs> um, so what we wanted to do uh, is uh, have a conversation with you this morning uh, against the backdrop of the inauguration of the 45th President of the United States. Uh, for some of us, uh, this day uh, represents an extraordinary moment of transition in the country, a moment that uh, portends uh, uh, some interesting possibilities. The reason why we were invited here, I suspect, is because at some point over the course of last year, uh, I wrote a letter to my son after uh, the murder of Alton Sterling and Philando Castile. Uh, and I wrote that letter to him in Time Magazine, and he responded. And part of what I wanted to do in the letter was to kind of think about what it meant for me as a father to witness this haunting ritual uh, of grief in American society, where an African-American family, a mother, a father, a child, uh, grieved in public, weeping, crying, uh, because they had to bury a loved one who was killed at the hands of the police. So I was trying to make sense of Alton Sterling's baby boy, who was about 15 years old at the time sobbing uncontrollably on the steps of City Hall in Baton Rouge, and trying to make sense of Diamond Reynolds's baby girl, not seven years old, not six years old, after Diamond Reynolds realized that Philando Castile was dying right in front of her, live on Facebook, and she said, Mommy, it's okay, I'm here with you. What, what was in her? Where did she find the resources, the courage, at such a tender, innocent young age to try to comfort her mother in the face of unimaginable loss. And oftentimes when we think about this stuff, when we think about the question of police brutality, when we think about the question of Black Lives Matter, when we think about uh, uh, the, the uh, protest, when we think about the sit-ins, when we think uh, about efforts to articulate a vision of American democracy and justice that fundamentally speaks right to the precarity of particular kinds of people and communities in this country. Precarity, precariousness, right? A sense that you don't know if your baby, once he walks out the door, will come back home. Something that so many families in this country don't experience. What does it mean every time you're stopped by the police that you might be concerned 
that something would happen to you. Some families don't have that worry. They have uh, an unquestionable trust. And so I wanted to write this letter because at that moment, even though I was so happy to see the back of my son's head, uh, that's a southern Mississippi way of saying I was so happy to see him leave the house to go to Brown. I wanted him back home with me. I wanted him back home. I wish he was seven again uh, because he loved me then. <laughs> um, and I could protect him. And so I wanted to take that question of criminal justice, the issue of policing, and take it out of the abstract and make it intimate. Because oftentimes when we're dealing with people of color, oftentimes when we're dealing with black people, oftentimes when we're dealing with the question of police violence, we're dealing with abstractions. Not the human beings right in front of you. Not the people who are crying, not the people who are scared, not the people who are worried and concerned, right, who are grieving. It's an abstraction. It's almost like American theater. I'm going to give it to you in a minute, son. It's almost like American theater. You know, my favorite author, James Baldwin, I'm writing a book on him now entitled James Baldwin's America, 1963 to 1972, from Fire Next Time to No Name in the Street. James Baldwin says about America, he says, it's like a monotonous minstrel show. The same old songs, the same old dance, the same old jokes. Bless you. <laughs> We've seen the show or been the show for so long, we could do it in our sleep. And so I wanted to write a letter to my baby, to this six foot one size 13 shoe wearing child <laughs> who leaves these obstacles around the house when he comes home. They're not shoes, they're obstacles. <laughs> and let him know that I loved him and that I wish I could protect him, knowing damn well that I couldn't. Well, it's always hard to go after dad. <laughs> um, before I begin, I want to speak directly to students of color here in this room. Um, in the, as, as Trump's presidency becomes a reality, uh, many of us, myself included, are feeling many emotions right now, uh, particularly fear, rage, and anxiety. Um, I want to tell you all that you're not alone to lean on each other, and to really hold those emotions, to keep them and understand them, and use them. Because now, more than ever, is the time that we, as a people, especially as young people in this generation, have to take action. That being said, I responded to my dad in his emotional letter, mainly because I'm doing the work right now in trying to get police reform. Um, my generation is growing up in the age of the internet. Twitter, Facebook, all that good stuff. Instagram, Snapchat. Snapchat. <laughs> um, and as police brutality becomes a national issue, we are constantly bombarded with images and videos of black death. Of black, being, of black people being murdered. But these aren't just abstract black people far away in some distant land. For me, it was Trayvon Martin. Mm. When the Trayvon Martin killing happened, he was the same age as me. My favorite candy is Skittles. Who doesn't love Arizona tea? It spoke to me, that situation, because I remembered how often I would be followed in stores, how many times I was stopped by police officers fearing for my life, how many times I've witnessed police officers brutalizing my friends, family members. And it struck a chord in me to really take on this role of resistance and activism. I got to tell the truth. Hmm? Our generation is leading the movement. It's not Sharpton, it's not Jackson, it's not the people that you see constantly on TV talking about Black Lives Matter, it's us. We are on the ground doing the work. 
but the media, society doesn't show that. Now, in the wake of a Trump presidency, that work has to continue. And it has to increase. It has to become more radical. Hmm. Not just for the sake of activism or the sake of calling yourself you know, liberal or Democrat or what have you, or progressive or what have you, but because as a person of color, as a black man who has friends of color and has family, our lives are really at stake. Right. And I wanted to show that with Dad, because when he reminded me that he wanted me to be a seven-year-old again, I thought to myself, that'd be kind of dope. <laughs> you know, the biggest thing I have to worry about is what color crown I want to use. Um, but then I remember Tamir Rice, 12 years old, murdered. I remember Trayvon Martin. I remember Michael Brown. For us, childhood doesn't protect us. We have to protect our future. So we have to do the work. And you know, one of the things, uh, Langston, oftentimes we, we, did a, we did a couple of shows. We did CNN after we wrote the letter. We did Democracy Now!, which is our more natural environment. Um, and we kept telling each other we loved each other on television. Uh, you know, love you, son. He said, love you, dad. And people kept saying, well, we, didn't, we rarely see black people, black men particularly, expressing that uh, in this venue, right? And I just kept thinking, I kept thinking, I, as, and I, I was thinking of it as you were speaking so eloquently there. Um, very proud of you, Doc. Appreciate um, it. One of the most frustrating things about being black in this country, sitting in rooms like this at Taft, of Watertown, Connecticut, or sitting in my classroom at Princeton, in Princeton, New Jersey, one of the most frustrating things about being black in this country is that we're constantly trying to convince white folks of the, of the hell we catch. <laughs> that we always have to engage in the work of convincing you that what's happening to us is actually real. Because there's this automatic assumption that we want to trade in something like victimization, that we want in some ways to have, uh, to elicit guilt from you, to, to elicit your pity, and that we really want you to give us something for free as opposed to the reality of me as a father trying to worry about this black man coming home. And what happens because of this, we find ourselves dancing, right? We find ourselves dancing. See, I don't have to dance anymore. He might have to. I don't. I have an endowed chair at Princeton. I'm wearing a Hickey Freeman suit. <laughs> I, I, you know, by every standard of measure, I have achieved the American dream. But just yesterday, after I published a piece in Time Magazine, someone said, Eddie Glaude, do you want to be free? Go back to Africa because of my democratic disagreement with the election of Trump. And mind you, I have been an ardent critic of Obama, President Obama. I called him a Melvillian confidence man, selling the snake oil of hope and change. Right? But this idea, Doc, of having to convince, yeah, I called him Doc, yeah. Uh, this idea of having to convince white America of our suffering goes to something you were talking to me about um, on the drive down here or up here um, about honesty. Mm. But you, you seem to believe that we, we are not honest with ourselves about the reality of this country. Say a little bit more about that. I'm trying to have, I'm really having trouble with this flower. <laughs> <laughs> it's cute, but I, I want to look at him, you know? <laughs> Anybody, I'm going to give them to somebody right after this. We'll go ahead. <laughs> yeah, um, honesty. We are where we are now because America has failed to be honest with itself since we were here, <laughs> since, since we were founded, brought here, right. since it's founded. We as a nation have failed to be honest with each other and ourselves about the racial history in this country. That's a very abstract thing to say, but it's a reality. 
<laughs> we all, it's, it's hard to speak, man. Yeah, but Governor LePage, <laughs> think about Governor LePage in Maine. Oh, it's true. Oh, my gosh. Um, look that up if you don't know that. Um, we have to be honest with ourselves about the state of this country if we want to go anywhere. What America has done to people of color, specifically black people, mm. is beyond words. And when you really get into the history of it, some of the atrocities that you see have never been remedied. In fact, they're continued and still happen today. Mm. Um, I particularly study uh, prisons, the prison industrial complex. And when you see how the prison industrial complex works from prisons to the justice systems to businesses literally buying prisoners to work for them. And you compare it to previous institutions, slavery. There's almost a direct correlation between those histories. It's our failure to be honesty that allow these systems to continue. Right. So my argument is that we as a generation, specifically young people like us who are doing this work, we have to be more honest and brutally honest. We can't tiptoe around these topics anymore. We can't afford to. That's not a privilege we have. We have to face it. Right. And let, let, me be, let, let me be clear, because I, I, you know, I write about this in my book, Democracy in Black, right? So we can understand this. Mm -hmm. right? We want to think about racial inequality. We want to think about racism in melodramatic terms, as if we're watching a soap opera, like All My Children, where you have the good people and the bad people that are readily distinguishable. And oftentimes, what we do when we talk about race in this country is that we think about it in a melodramatic way, where we want to find and identify the bad actors. Those are the bad people over there who are screaming the N-word, who, who are embracing a form of white nationalism. Those are the bad folks. When in fact, racial inequality in this country is a cultural practice. Mm -hmm. Understand that language. It, racial inequality in this country is a cultural practice. And let me use an analogy so that you can understand what I mean. I believe the planet is actually getting warmer. How many of you believe in climate change? Thank God Taft is educating you. <laughs> Y'all can laugh, shit. Um, <laughs> right? That climate change is actually happening. This is the way I teach at Princeton. So, climate change is actually happening. But if you look at my lifestyle, if you look at the choices I make, you would think that I believe the planet is just fine. Look at my house. Look at my car. Look at my light bulbs. All the choices I make suggest that I believe that the planet is just fine. Right? So we tend to think of racial inequality in the way that people are consciously, intentionally engaging in racist acts. So we want to find, as we do in the law, intention. Right? That somebody is intentionally discriminating against someone. But when you think about it as a cultural practice, it's not about bad people and good people. It's about the choices we're making day in and day out. There's a way, there's a reason why Taft looks this way. There's a reason why black unemployment in this country is always twice that of white unemployment. It's not because black people are lazy. It's because for much of our history, we had a dual labor market. There's a reason why black wealth is what it is compared to white wealth. It's not because black people don't want to work, aren't working hard. It's because we've had a dual housing market, right? Where black folk didn't have access to homeowner, homeowner loans, right? That we didn't have access to resources as the white middle, as the American middle class was expanding precisely because Southern legislators in cahoots with Northern legislatures, block legislators blocking black folk from access. And it's not about black people right, uh, being uh, overly criminal. Right? It's about our communities being overly policed. I always say at Princeton, if Trenton police or Princeton police showed up at Princeton on a Thursday night and police Prospect Street the way they police Trenton, it would be a very different courtroom on Monday morning. Y'all understand what I'm saying to you? So it's a cultural practice. People aren't saying, I'm not racist. I just want my kids to go to a good school. 
What does that usually mean? Social science data shows that it means, when we say that, that most people are saying, are asking the question, how many black and brown kids go to that school? That's why America's schools are as segregated today as they were in 1955 driven by residential segregation patterns because we've never enforced the Fair Housing Act of 1968 and now Ben Carson thinks that the Fair Housing Act of 1968 was in fact a socialist doctrine and he's now will run, he will now run HUD. Right? So when we think of racial inequality as a cultural practice evidenced in our habits driven by our fears this is not about white against black. Don't get uncomfortable, I hear you moving. It's not about black against white. It's about all of us being honest with ourselves, right? And understanding that there are people, human beings right in front of you, not abstract black people, not abstract illegal, al illegal aliens, whatever that phrase means, not abstract people who are in same-sex loving relationships, not abstract human beings, but real, breathing people who love, who are wounded, who hate, who experience joy, who laugh, right, who cry. Does that make sense to you? Absolutely. Uh, and I think one of the big things that I want to uh, stress is that racism is not an ideology. Racism is a practice. It's a cultural habit. This tends to follow me when I speak around the country. So go ahead. <laughs> it's a cultural habit, right? You don't have to be consciously racist to be racist. That's how you see constantly all these different accidental racist incident, incidents happening across the country. Yeah, good. It's not, we have to constant, racism is not something that you can just say, I don't believe in racism or I'm not racist. You have to constantly work at it. It's a, something that you have to constantly practice to not be, right? Because racial habits and racism is embedded in the very fabric of American life and the very fabric of American society. It's literally the foundation of almost every institution in this country. You can find some linkage to racism. Yeah. At the very moment in which John Adams declares freedom, in the very moment in the context of the Re American Revolution, John Adams puts forward an idea of freedom. It is predicated upon an intimate understanding of unfreedom. He says to King George, we will not be your Negroes. We will not be your Negroes. Right. There's a sense in which this contradiction this contradiction has been at the heart of this country since its inception. And the question is, how are you going to engage it? The question is how you will confront it, right? The question is how you're gonna engage it. James Baldwin says, it's not, it is the innocence that is the crime. It is the innocence that is the crime. Americans walk around here like we are the lost boys in, in Never Never Land, trying to avoid responsibility and accountability, right? try to avoid responsibility and accountability. You are all born in a time such as these. You are the same age as my son, many of you, or you will be on your way to places like Brown or Duke or, or Yale. I had to mention it for headmaster. Uh, you're on your way to those sorts of spaces and you're going to acquire a kind of cultural capital that will allow you to be change agents in, these, in this world. The question is, what kind of world do you want to live in? What kind of human being do you want to be? I'm pointing at you. What kind of human being do you want to be? What kind of human being do you want, what kind of world do you want your children to grow up in? What kind of world do you want? And in fact, that's not going to happen without you doing the work, Absolutely. actively doing the work. So with that, let's have a conversation. Is that okay? We got a few, just a couple of minutes, and then we'll probably have to continue in the back room. But we came here to challenge. We didn't come here to make you comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> so the mics are there. Yes. Um, so one thing I really support is uh, reparations. Um, I was wondering if if you do as well, um, and if so, what form do you think they should take in this country? I could take that one. I'm studying that right now. 
Um, the thing about reparations is reparation, reparations or the process for reparations are actually starting all over the world right now. Um, Haiti is demanding France to pay reparations. Um, a lot of the Caribbean islands are demanding reparations. Um, I am completely in support of that, um, mainly because when you look at the history of many of these Afro-diasporic areas, um, <coughs> reparations are needed to rectify a lot of the inequality that you see along racial lines. So I'm in support of it. I'm in support of it, but it all depends on what we mean by reparations. Exactly. Right? So in the public imagination, reparations is just simply the federal government cutting a check and giving it to black people. Mm -hmm. That's not what reparations is, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you read a uh, text, uh, a wonderful book by Kathy Kramer about uh, the, sh the changing in Wisconsin. Part of the underlying tension in the country particularly among uh, white working class folks, right, is that they believe that the federal government is taking things from them as they work harder and, re and are receiving less, as they bust their behinds, right, and can't imagine that their children will have a better life than them, as they're busting their behinds and their houses aren't worth anything, that the big federal government is taking money from deserving people and giving it to undeserving people, right? And at the heart of this is this kind of re economic insecurity that's bound up with a sense of resentment. So we have to think about reparations in a much more expansive way, because what we do know is that racial equality is not a zero-sum game. Right? And until we get rid of that view that racial equality is a zero-sum game, we will always find ourselves over and over again confronting the backlash. So reparations has everything to do with me, for me, in terms of actual policy that will address right, the fundamental um, inequality in the jobs market, in the labor market the fundamental inequality that we, that we see in the housing market, right? The fundamental inequality that we see in public education, right? And so we, there's a way in which you could do this by targeting with targeted policy, but it's very difficult for us to do that when people think that racial equality is a zero-sum game, where we're taking stuff from hardworking white people and giving it to lazy, undeserving black and brown people. And reparations does not mean just the check. It means the, the dis active dismantling of institutions of racism that permeate throughout the entire structure of American society and society, global society, I would argue. So We, uh, I think we'll just have time for one more and then we'll continue the discussion in the faculty room, A block, and then Professor Glad and Mike will be here through B and C, so if you want to have lunch with them, in the, in, that would be wonderful. And is there a last question? Uh, who do we have? Would you mind uh, distinguishing for all of us the difference between Black Lives Matter, All Lives Matter, and then some might say Blue and White Lives Matter? <laughs> you want to take that one? Yeah. <laughs> All lives matter. <laughs> we concede that claim. Mm -hmm. Of course, of course they do. All lives matter. Of course they do. Uh, black life is a part of the world that we live in, that we inhabit. And people who say all lives matter in response to black lives matter are folks who are in some ways refusing to look the specificity of suffering squarely in the face, period. And let me be very, very clear, right? When people say all lives matter in response to black lives matter, that's like saying in effect, right, uh, lungs matter when you've been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Mm -hmm. Right, the body matters, right? But there's specificity. There's a specificity of suffering, and part of that claim is designed to get black suffering out of view, right? To move it out of view, right? And and to be honest with you, it gets on my last nerves. But go ahead. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. Um, Black Lives Matter is not a statement that repudiates. Refute. Or refutes, I'm sorry. Repudiates. <laughs> repudiates and refutes. Repudiates. There you go. Mix up of words there. I'm still learning. Um, it's not a statement that re repudiates. Repudiates <laughs> the fact that all lives matter. We're living, we say it because we're living in a country that constantly tells black people that their lives do not matter. 
So to say Black Lives Matter is to directly challenge the racial practice right. that states that black lives do not matter in this country. Let me, let me give you an example of what we mean, right, really quickly, right? So usually when people invoke all lives matter mm -hmm. uh, in response to black lives matter, the first thing that they talk about is black on black crime. Y'all hear, you're right? And we know that black on black crime is a category that's created in the context of, of the 1960s uh, civil, civil rights revolution as a way to counter a certain kind of claim that's being made. Now let's think about this. Much, most of crime in the United States actually takes place uh, among groups that live with each other. So 80 plus percent of white crime is white on white crime. Do we have a category called white on white crime? Do we have a category like white on white crime that accounts for what's happening in Appalachia? Do we have a ca category of white on white crime that accounts for what's happening in the rural areas of Maine? the rural areas of North Dakota and South Dakota, or Idaho, or Iowa, a category like white on white crime. Remember, 80 plus percent of crime in white communities is, in fact, white on white crime. Black on black crime at 90 plus percent. Having everything to do, both of those statistical moments reflect what? Deepening residential segregation. That we don't live with each other. That our neighborhoods, 73, 75 percent of black of white associations are entirely white. The folk you hang out with, the folk who come over your house, the folk you spend Christmas with, the folk you break breakfast with, I mean, have Thanksgiving with. 90, 75% of our associations black and, are homogeneous. We're a segregated community. So if we want to get rid of black on black crime, we don't need someone like Rudy Giuliani telling us to socialize our children better. What we need are integrated communities and then maybe we could prey on each other. <laughs> you see? So part, part of what we're saying is that all lives matter reflects this evasive move. It's the dance. It's the dance mm -hmm. that, refute, that, that gets in the way of us actually addressing the fundamental contradiction that blocks the genuine achievement of democracy in this country. And with that, we know you got to go to class. Uh, Langston and I would like to thank you. <laughs> thank you.